Xin chào. What's up, everybody? How we doing out there? This is going to be a potentially triggering video for many of my friends that have that do live in Saigon, in Vietnam, in Ho Chi Minh City. I think some of you guys are going to maybe agree with me, but some of you aren't. Uh, I mean, no disrespect to anybody. It's just my kind of opinion after being here for a while. So in this video today, everybody, we're going to talk about, in my opinion, the worst investments that expats make when they first move to Saigon. Specifically, if they're going to be driving around on a motorbike. Yes, you're going to hear me say it now. I was a big proponent for getting, you know, a Yamaha MT-15. At the end of the day, that thing costs close to $4,000. And after four years of living here, let's just be honest, it's effing... It was, it was useless. It wasn't comfortable to drive. You got traffic like this everywhere. This is like the fastest you can go in, I swear, all of Saigon. It doesn't ever really get any faster than this. Maybe a bit of highway, or not even highway, like here, this one bridge is the only place I really know of and a couple others like this bridge that you can kind of drop it and gun it just a little bit, but really there's nowhere to use, to use it. Guys, there's nowhere to use it. There's nowhere to use even 150 cc, you know, something like an MT-15 or a Honda or, or any of those motorcycles that start at like a 2,000 and go to 4,000 price range. It's a complete waste of money. It's not needed. I know this is going to be controversial. You want to know what you really need? Most likely, if you're going to be driving around and you got to go to work and you got to commute, get yourself a, a less than two year old automatic scooter. Boom. $2,000 or less. Done. Get yourself something that's automatic. They're all the same. I don't care which one you get. If it's only a couple years old, get a Honda, get a Yamaha, get whatever you want. They're all good here. Because there's no, like, one thing Vietnam does pretty cool on their scooters and motorbikes is they don't sell any weird models. Like, there's no, they do get some weird models of some things, but for the most part, they get a lot of the same models and a lot of the same models for the same years using a lot of the same parts. So you're not going to have a problem fixing it, maintenance, etc. You know, I think it's, and then let's go on to like a nice looking bike, like a PCX or a, you know, you can start to get into the threes and $4,000 on these scooters too. Unless you're going to be parking that thing inside and then like super anal on everywhere you park it, anywhere you go and like pay the person to park it by them. In, in a month, it's going to get scratched, it, especially if you drive anywhere and park it anywhere other than your house. It's going to get scratched. It's going to get damaged. There's no way to keep them in like really good condition unless you're crazy about like uh, trying to get a good parking spot when you go somewhere. Because so, like the problem, like I was, it was pretty good with my bike. So usually once you have like a value of 3,500, 3,000 or more on a motorcycle, these parking places will accommodate. Like every parking place after a while all around here, they all knew who I was. I'd pull up in my MT. I'd pay them, sometimes I'd pay them 5k extra, and they'd park my bike below, they'd park my bike right at the entrance, like right where the guy would sit, off to the side, off by itself. And they would often do that with all the motorbikes that cost like three grand or more. Because they understood that they didn't want to damage it and try to be liable for it either. But there's instances like where you would go to the mall or places where there's not um, somebody around, you know, to watch, where you, where you park and get off and then come back and pay at like a ticket thing when you leave. There's nothing you can do there, guys. Vietnamese are crazy about like, it, it blows my mind how hard they work, but just like anywhere in America, Vietnamese don't want to walk. So if they're going to a mall, they're all going to try as close to park as close as they can towards the escalator or the elevator because they don't want to walk. So like, you have to be crazy like in America and park like in the weird lot in the middle of nowhere and like walk all the way back in the corner. So, and, and it's still, it becomes infinitely much more harder to do what I'm talking about than what it would be in America or, or where you're normally from. And the whole thing, like what really tipped me is, you know, after like three years, three and a half years, dude, my MT-15 just sat there. Just fucking sat there. I never used it. I was driving it like once a week. Like, why do I need this if I'm driving it once a week? Especially if you don't have a job, you don't even need the bike at all. If you don't need the job or if you're not like, it seems like all the guys like over 55, 60, they have to buy a motorbike when they come to Vietnam or like any Southeast Asia because you know, they gotta go adventuring every day. So that's a little bit different, but like 
for the most part, a lot of you guys, if you're just gonna try to like, you know, do digital online nomad shit, you don't fucking need a bike. It's a, at all. Just walk, get a good apartment in a good area. But if you're trying to be some like brokey that lives, I don't know, an hour away from the center of town, then maybe you'll need a bike, but. Brokey. <laughs> I kid, I kid. But I mean, I think that's the, uh, I think that's the biggest worst purchase that a lot of guys make here. Cause I'm not the only one that's like, I'm not gonna ride a scooter. And I have no problem with scooters. I had rode scooters before. I had had a scooter before in America. So I had already known that like scooters aren't like, you know, lame like we look at them in America. I didn't really look at it that way, but I was just like, oh, I wanna do it right. I wanna get a motorcycle, but I tell you, absolutely just zero need for it, guys. Just save the money. In hindsight, I could have used that like 2,500. I mean, thankfully I made out when I sold my MT. I didn't lose much. I think it cost a little over 800. A little over $800 to drive that thing for like three and a half years. And I don't think that's bad. That's how you gotta kind of look at that stuff. So I don't think $800 to drive that thing for three and a half years was bad. But I didn't really, I didn't need it. I didn't need it. I could have easily bought something for 15, 20 million thousand bucks or less been happy been efficient and calling it a day so i mean unless you're like and other thing is who are you showing off to when you buy this thing it doesn't really impress anybody but other guys and this kind of takes guys a while to figure out you're certainly not going to impress a girl by showing up with an mt15 like she's going to be like cool she ain't going to know shit about shit anyway so at the end of the day, who, who are we really impressing? Anywho. Now, would I buy another big bike again? Oh, man, I'm super torn. I've been thinking about it. I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know. If I had super... Here's my flip side and my flip side to my whole point I just made. And the whole counterpoint, everything I just said. If you absolutely have the money for it and it's not gonna affect you in any way, and I had the money for it and I still did, didn't need to sell it, but if you absolutely have all the means and wells and, and ends to get it without any kind of repercussion and you'll never need anything back and it's just something for you to have every once in a while, go for it, man. There's no problem with that. But for the most part, if you know you ain't gonna use it, uh, reassess it, at least just reassess it, you know? Rethink about the purchase do you really need an upright actual motorcycle for just commuting around in Saigon do you that's what you need to think about and that's what you know I had told myself in my head I'll, I'll do a couple a little bit of motorbike trips around Vietnam now an event that never happened and I knew that was never gonna happen because I know how dangerous it is to drive around on a motorcycle now there's some people here that love riding around doing cross-country trips shout out to my homie Tom you know, a bunch of my top tier supporters love doing motorcycle trips, but these are guys that have been riding motorcycle for 20, 40 years. They're wearing full gear when they go and ride around in Vietnam. We're talking leathers head to toe, gloves on, full helmet. So a little bit different circumstances, you know? So that's what I would really assess. Like, are you gonna really actually, you know, use this thing for, for what you think you're gonna use it for? And, and almost my suggestion would be to rent now. You know, you can rent a, a like a Duke 390 here. You don't have to have shit either. Nobody gives a shit about any kind of license here. So like, although I have a video and it's easy to get your motorbike license here, nobody gives two flying shits if you have a license here. Nobody gives a fuck. Unless you drive like a fucking Riri every day of every second, then maybe you could get into some trouble, but if you just drive slightly normal, they don't care. They, they want a bribe from anyone they pull over, or not a bribe, a uh, maintenance fee for their bike. Let's call it that, sure. They, they're gonna want something from anybody anyways, whether you're white, uh, purple, green, red, whatever. They're pulling you over for that exact purpose, so. A license ain't gonna make a, a lick of damn. Uh, there's no need to have it. I don't even see it being a problem if uh, some guy was trying to like push back at me IRL, he's like, some anal guy I know. He's not like a friend, he's a acquaintance that hangs out with us sometimes. And he's like, what if you murder somebody? And I'm like, dude, we're in Vietnam. I, I don't know that 
technically having the license that you probably didn't really get the right way anyways is really gonna save you. I don't know. But I guess maybe he has a point there, but I doubt, like, in my head, I still don't think it'd do shit. I don't think it'd make a difference, like, and how are you gonna kill somebody on a scooter? Like, that's pretty difficult. It's vice versa here. Almost all the scooter deaths happen from, uh, unfortunately, head-on collisions from trucks and buses. And, and trucks and buses. Usually something bigger, brakes quit. Unfortunately, two uh, siblings died yesterday morning. Uh, like, you know, going up one of these mountains, going to one of these uh, vacation towns, hitting a head on to a bus. Bus or truck, I can't remember, but they both deceased. They were both on the motorbike. So it's, it's a, a thing to really be careful about here too. Like, are you an experienced rider? Do you want to take that chance? Do you have kids? What age range are you at? Are you a person that wants to take a risk? Um, there's always a time when you can walk around pre-COVID in Saigon and see uh, usually white tourists in some kind of cast or a lot of road rash all over their body. You can probably figure out why they have that. Yes, from a motorbike accident because they made it their first trip. I've in fact met people here where they were teaching themselves how to drive a manual transmission driving a motorbike for the first time ever here and then planning to go on a cross-country trip which I couldn't recommend any less so these are very very terrible ideas of things to do you know outside of cancer and like all the health stuff here that's like the number one death of dying in Vietnam is motorcycle accidents so I don't know I guess maybe if I'm young I think these things all changed when I was young if I was 30 mid 30s early 30s 20s I might be more keen on all this stuff I'm now kind of giving you a perspective from a 40 year old man now so I think a little smarter or wiser I, I would have done not even since I moved here in the four years I think there's no way me now would never buy the MT-15 just to have a cool looking thing like that in the back of my head that's why I got it and so I'm not driving around a scooter not really needed and I knew I was never going to take a, any kind of trip on a motorbike. Because I don't like being on a... That's another thing, too. you got to go see if you're comfortable even on a motorcycle for longer than a half hour. If you're not riding a bicycle, go ride around like you're uh, a motorcycle for a half hour, an hour. And then see what two hours feels like. And you'll be like, fuh. So then you start moving at like a turtle's pace if you do go do the moto trip. There's lots of things to look at. You can kind of go and look at like uh, Bald and Bankrupt's channel. As well, he's done plenty of motorcycle expeditions. Uh, Harold has too. So they, they turn out pretty good sometimes, but you know, these guys are experienced riders. You know, uh, Paul Bankrupt lived in India for, I forgot what it was, 10 years. And I think uh, Harold also lived in uh, Thailand for a long time. People don't really know that unless you've watched all of his stuff, but he lived in Thailand for quite a while. I think five years, he even bought a condo. I think he even had a wife, a Thai wife that he even tried to take back to wherever he's from you have to really go back for these it's it's hard to find them like when he used to have everything posted before he got all attacked on the internet like anybody does that eventually becomes popular i'm digressing but i thought i've thought about this video for a while i just wanted to let you know we do have the grom still in the uh in the horse stable and i still approve the ground purchase they're a little under two thousand it's a good bike uh we have no problems with that purchase again we don't drive much but when we do it's a pleasure to drive it's cheap to maintain um and it, and it holds value pretty well too so as far as the grom still a great bike as far as even needing that would i even still say buy that you know when when wanted it you know she she's advancing in her career as she's in her 30s and making more money so you start to buy stuff like that when you do so we would have got that anyways because you know that's signs of her being happy with her success and in her job and these are things that you need to celebrate in life with buying things like that so you know what i'm saying if you know what i'm saying if you want to hang out with your boy fat and broke when you get back or when you come to saigon you got to sign up for the patreon you can hit me up and dm on there i usually get back to the dms within two or three days depends on what's going on sometimes the system for the uh, patreon dms doesn't tell me anybody has alerted me in any way so I actually have to go into the desktop and refresh it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
But there you can have direct access to me. We can go on a private tour here. You pay what you want at the end. You can also support the channel in additional ways. We got uh, tons of great content on there. We have a companion video to uh, a video I did before this. So, so much additional content down there. I think everybody finds that it's well worth it. If you want a discount, you can sign up for a year for a uh, hundred bucks. So I think that's really the way to go. They give you a pretty big discount for that. All the uh, YouTube series stuff for being a YouTuber is gonna be on the tier two. So if you do want access to that, it's gonna be on the tier two on the Patreon. If you wanna watch me live stream, that's over at kick.com forward slash fat bro. As ever, I love you guys. Thank you for watching. Stay frosty. We shall see you on the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Peace out.